I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. Roger. Everyone and welcome to another episode of the Punk Rocker Moon Stomper podcast. Um, as always, I am one of your intrepid hosts. I'm going to call myself intrepid from now on. Uh, Amy Shearer Title. You may know me from Vintage Space, all the space things, but also my uh, expressed love of beer on the internet. Um, and joining me as always is my lovely co-host. I'm Jason McClellan, and I also have a lovely love for beer. We love beer on this show, and today <laughs> is going to be a super beer-filled episode. Yes, this is the perfect segue because joining us today, I'm super excited, is Andrew Marshall, who is a brewery supervisor at Stone, which is awesome because we're going to learn so much about beer. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, uh, it's an honor to be on the show. Oh, thanks. I don't know that you'd call it an honor per se, but I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So before we get into anything else, um, we got to open beer because okay. it's... Uh, I love that we do this on a, on a, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but it's always like, we need to get into the drinking, so we'll just pretend that it's later. Um, so today, I'm, I had to do this because it was fitting. Um, I guess, actually, maybe before we do this, I should just say that I met Andrew um, because he ordered my book on my website, and the order was late, and he emailed me to ask where it was. And then we got to talking about things like beer and how you're supposed to drink IPAs sooner rather than later, which is something I've never heard. So we're going to talk to you about that. But I figured since this is expired, I'm going to drink the Stone Enjoy By IPA today, which I realize this bottle is massive and it's going to kill me. Uh, Jason, what are you drinking today? Well, I thought about picking up a Stone Brew for today's show, but I'm super excited to try beer. I just got in the mail and that is the uh, Secret Weapon Beer. It's a special brew that uh, the band MXPX did, a collaboration with Silver City Brewing in their hometown of Bremerton, Washington. And this is uh, to commemorate the band's 25th anniversary. And uh, they wanted to, when they got together with the brewery, they wanted a beer that would be good enough for, that it would still have a full flavor, but also be good and light-bodied for sweaty punk rock shows. So it's a it's an amber lager. I have not tried it yet, and they don't have distribution. It's just really in Washington and northern Idaho, I guess. But they partnered with a Seattle-based interesting beer company that works with local distribution companies. So they will contact the local distribution company, mail the beer to that local company, and that local company will then deliver it to your house. So that's how I have my 16 cans of Secret Weapon beer. So haven't had it yet. That's cool. It's a good story. Uh, and Andrew, what are you drinking today? All right. One of the benefits of working at a brewery is I get all kinds of our uh, one-offs and research dispatches. So this is a one-off um, brewed by one of our brewers that rotates from our Escondido location down to our uh, brewery restaurant down at Liberty Station in San Diego. So this is an Imperial Pilsner um, that had uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc juice and then re-fermented on champagne yeast. Interesting. Oh, wow. That's yeah. so good. So. Oh, my God. Um, that's definitely <laughs> one of the most experimental beers I've ever yeah. heard of. Um, yeah, all right. Fun. Let's Speaking of, let's get to drinking. Ready? All right. <laughs> sort of get the little sound bite of the a little thing. bit so um all right well let's just start with start with the beer because this is going to be this is going to be a driving force obviously um right. so andrew why don't you just tell us a little bit about like your story like how did you end up as a brewery supervisor at stone like how does how do you just do that so um about 10 years ago um uh just prior to the great recession um, uh, myself and um, a couple I knew said, I want to have this fun venture and start a little brewery. So uh, we did that just before the recession. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, my prior career of construction uh, went up in a giant nuclear cloud and uh, had this little brewery uh, uh, left. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. And, and uh, you know, we were relatively successful. And uh, after a few years, it looked like my you know, partner and I didn't really see eye to eye. So I left and, and uh, sold them my shares. And, uh, a friend of mine who actually lived in my little small town was the the brewmaster of Stone, uh, Mitch Steele, my, my mentor. 
And so he said, hey, man, you're sitting at home doing nothing. Why don't you, uh, you know, come down and uh, see if you can do something down here? So, um, you know, sort of down there is basically just uh, brewing and eventually uh, decided I didn't want, didn't want to work so much with my back and more with my head. And now I'm brew supervisor. And so oh, it all. And, oh, yeah, and cheers, by the way. Cheers. Oh, yeah, cheers. Sorry, I just realized we should do that. <laughs> cheers. Um, so it really is just knowing the right people. The more I feel like the more I the older I get, the more it's just like nepotism and whatever the friend version of nepotism is <laughs> sure is there a word doesn't for that? hurt there has to be there's a word for everything so yeah. true we could just pretend it's german and just like smush words together to make a new one um okay so you sort of fell into this weird world of brewing but you so how much what's the learning curve like when you just sort of walk into an existing brewery like this so it's kind of interesting because, you know, you, 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 you see the bottles and you see their, their kind of, you know, outward appearance and you say, hey, this is a big company that has their, their act really together. And then you see it from the inside out and it's like, oh, I could actually make some differences here and, and uh, you know, do some things. So it's interesting just to kind of see the difference of, of the perception versus yeah. the reality. And that, uh, you know, even coming in with my, you know, with my limited experience at a small brewery, I can actually come in and, and you know, do, wow. do things and, and uh, you know. Help us plan better. Help us uh, uh, estimate better, and things like that. That's awesome, and I mean, it's in interesting with uh, breweries, even breweries that are you know very well known across the country and even a, a, the world. Um, it's fascinating when you find out and look into the numbers and realize how small these companies actually are that are producing large volumes right. of beer. And Stone is one of those. And I think Stone is Stone's the currently the tenth largest in the states, aren't they? Craft, uh, craft, yeah, craft. yeah, tenth largest craft. Yeah, brewery, yeah. And that's yeah. incredible. And do you do you off the top of your head know how many employees Stone has? About a thousand? thousand right now. Okay, that's incredible. Yeah, but that's a uh, yeah. But keep in mind that we uh, just in the last year we opened a, a brewery in uh, Berlin, Germany, wow. as well as a brewery twice the size of our Escondido one in uh, Richmond, Virginia. So that's kind of you know expanding pretty quickly. Still expanding people, after twenty years pretty quickly. Do people drink in Virginia? Uh, apparently they do. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my limited experience living out in that bit of the country, it's always like the weirdest liquor laws and you have to really hunt down good beer. Um, oh, yeah. Just because I don't actually know the difference. At what point are you distinguished as a craft brewery versus like what's the alternative? I imagine like Budweiser would be like. Yeah. What do we call know, them? Uh, sort of the... like an example of the other kind, but like where, where is the line and like how, what's the balance in the country? I have no idea. Okay. So the, we, we could uh, talk about them as the uh, industrial loggers or American industrial loggers and versus the, the craft. And, and that's all kind of, um, it, 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 it's, it changes, you know, it's, it's uh, just in the time I've been in the, the decade I've been in the craft beer business, the, the definition of craft has, you know, changed and evolved and it does, you know, every uh, other year or so there's a, um, there's a trade group called the Brewers Association, uh, and they they kind of have their own definition that that um, they manipulate for you know whatever political reasons or to uh, marketing reasons. Um, so you know, w historically it's been craft beer is is uh, brewed with only the you know the um, ingredients to give it bold flavor, exciting flavor, as opposed to um, you know basically something mass produced for the the least common denominator. Um, and, and that's really kind of evolving as we speak, you know, especially over the last couple of years, there's been a whole lot of craft brewers that started, you know, 15, 20 years ago that are now exiting, uh, by, by selling to the, the big industrial brewers. So now there's, there's, you know, maybe a, you know, a, a dozen and a half brands that have been craft beer for, you know, 15 years. Now they're not considered by the Brewers Association definition craft beer because they're owned by a big yeah. conglomerate. But you know, their beer is still technically not really changing. Yeah. Some of them are some of them is changing, but but you know, some of them are not. Yeah, it's been interesting watching. There's a interesting uh sort of connection there or similarity, I think, to like the music industry and, and punk rock in particular, because you've got, you know, these craft brewers that people all of a sudden turn on because they sell out because they get bought out or, mm -hmm. or, you know, agree to partner with one of the major labels. Um, and AB's done that a lot in recent years, scooping up a lot of the craft breweries. But I like that 
what they've done, and it's the same thing with a, a major record label, is they've enhanced the distribution and uh, you know exposure yeah. that these breweries get. And for the most part, at least looking from the outside, AB keeps their hands off, you know, and lets them continue operating as mm-hmm. they have been. So they're still creating their product and doing what they do. But, you know, the big guys are noticing that that's good money. And, you know, if they can get their take of the money and, and own that in their portfolio while letting them still do what they do that has garnered uh, the attention and, and uh, grown their fan base, then good for them. So I don't have a problem with it. I know a lot of people have turned their backs on some fantastic craft breweries because they're now owned by the big guys, but I'm fine with that. And I congratulate those guys for their success. So. Yeah. And you know what? I'm on, I'm on the same page and this is, again, this is me, Andrew Marshall speaking. This is not sure. the stone uh, uh, philosophy, but um, yeah, we'll be hey. very clear. You are not representing your work right now. You are a <laughs> right. human on your downtime, yeah. hanging out and drinking a beer. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. You know, I, I, I'm not necessarily one of the ones that turns my back when someone, you know, sells to out to the man. And, you know, as a, as a business owner, as you know, multiple times in my past, um, Hey, if I had the opportunity to, to cash in or, you know, or, or, you know, have my exit strategy work out like that, I, I stand up and yeah. I applaud those guys and, and good for them, and, you know, and if the beer doesn't change great. And if the beer does change, you know, good for them. It, it had its place in time. It, it they, they have their legacy. And, and that's that. I hope they go live a happy life on their giant yachts and yeah. helicopters and whatever yeah. else the, you know, their lifestyle changes in campus. Yeah. Um, all right. I have some beer questions for you. More yes, beer questions. questions. Um, because, okay. So um, speaking of IPAs, you have to drink them sooner rather than later. Why? Okay. So the key components that make an IPA great are... Number one, the assertive bitterness, and number two, the hop uh, flavor and aroma. All of those degrade over time. So the best the beer is ever going to be is actually in my finished beer tank at work before we package it. And from that point forward, it degrades. Every IPA in the world is like that. There's just no way around it. That's how the how the um, the the natural metabolism works with within these beers. So, you know, after a week, can you really tell the big difference? Yeah, probably not. After two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, okay, now you're starting to pick up some changes, you know, and then once you get it out five or six months, it's distinctly different from what we intended it to be or we intended their IPA to be. And then, you know, after that, who knows what it turns into. So, yeah, because the the flavors that define the IPA are the hoppiness and the bitterness, um, which go away, that's that, you know, sooner is better than later. Right. And does that have to do with, I mean, forgive me because I've never made beer in my life and I'm, I don't know exactly the chemistry that's going on, but is that because of chemistry that continues happening inside a bottle that it's like, there's active, there's active cultures involved and stuff. Like, is that because it's, there's still actively changing things or is it just that it doesn't, pers- it can't persist by like what kind of magic? Yeah. Okay. So, um, it's not a, it's not a biological thing. It's, it's just a spontaneous, um, degradation. So I'm sure there's, there's, uh, I'm sure there's a specific chemical process behind it that is, you know, more than I know. But um, my understanding is that it's just a spontaneous degradation of both the the hot bitterness and the hot flavor and aroma. Okay. So you say like three weeks is the sweet spot for drinking all the IPAs? Oh, no. Day one is the sweet spot for drinking all the IPAs. Because I also wonder, like, how many people do you know or have you come across who have like a distinct not distinctive, distinguishing, I guess is the word, distinguishing enough palate to actually tell the difference between, like, I know you, you as a, a brewer knows what it's meant to taste like, but how often mm-hmm. do you find people who f- will drink a beer and be like, this doesn't taste good because it's old, but not really know about it versus people who are like, it's beer. Cause I, I didn't, I like, I've never heard of this. And I have had, um, I have IPAs that have been sitting in my house probably for a couple months that I just like mm-hmm. haven't gotten to yet. And I'm suddenly drinking all of them very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, you know, I have it's... no idea what they're supposed to taste like, so I don't yeah. know, but I'm just, yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah. So it's, it's just, uh, you know, you, you, how many people, you know, so I guess at the brewery and at the restaurant, there's, there's, you know, probably a fair amount, but we serve nothing but fresh beer there. Um, you know, out in the world, um, you know, who knows? Uh, I, you know, you have all different levels of people that number one, that, you know, oh, let me back up a little bit. Everybody is capable of telling the difference. 
It's just a matter of educating yourself. And how do you educate yourself? You drink a lot of beer, right? And so when you when you have some beers that are better than others, eventually you'll make the connection that oh, this is better because it was fresher. And it's it's one of the things that the you know having a local brewery is is fantastic. And I mean here in, in Southern California, um, and I'm sure in Arizona as well, you know there's there's hundreds of now small local breweries that you can get the beer. I mean that was finished that week and served to you in a glass that week, and it hasn't had to go through packaging. It hasn't had any chance to pick up oxygen or any of the you know the bad things that happen to it every time it's you know. Um, manipulated one way or another and uh yeah i think uh um i couldn't tell you a percentage but um i can tell you that just the more you drink you'll 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 kind of figure it out hooray for education i like that kind of education yeah. yes drink more so beer yeah, drink more i'm supposed to drink more. <laughs> right. um and does this go for other kinds of beer because i think the only time i've ever had a moment of like this is better than what i'm used to i i'm i do like guinness and i had a pint at the top of the Guinness Brewery when I was in Ireland, like, uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm old, but, like, more than a decade ago. And um, it was delicious. And, like, I always feel like the Guinness in Ireland, because I lived out there for a little over a month just traveling around, the Guinness there was way better than the Guinness is here. And I just couldn't figure out, like, does it just not fly well? Like, what is happening to this beer that it just doesn't taste as good in America or Canada, where I'm from, as it mm -hmm. does in Ireland? Like, I don't get it. Yeah. Well, there's there's a couple issues there that, that, that factor in. Um, one of them is that Guinness is actually made all over the world. So, oh. you know, when I was in brewing school, I was with uh, the brewers of Guinness in Brazil, you know. So there's 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 uh, there, there may be some differences there. But one thing that factors in is like if I think back to some of the best beer I've ever had in the world, one of them was at uh, uh, um, uh, Trumer in, I think, Salzburg, Austria. And you know, this is a a place where the 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 people that work there, that even the, the the tour guide was just so incredibly passionate and exciting, and and the whole presentation it just was it just you know made you feel amazing. And then to go and have a beer there, where you you see these these people that are around you, they're so proud of what they've done, and you see the Alps in the distance, wow. and you know these big beautiful windows, and then you taste the beer, and you know it's one of the best beer drinking experiences I've ever had. Now, if I had that same beer a month later, maybe at some, you know, grimy pub, would it be the same? I don't know. You know, I, I have a really fond memory yeah. of that. And that's what really accentuated the enjoyment of that particular beer. So, right. you know, Guinness, yeah, Guinness seems to age pretty well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of it. Um, and, and because it doesn't have the, the, the hot flavor and aroma to, that, that will you know, degrade and change the beer, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more stable beer than an mm. IPA by far. I've never thought about the fact that massive like international beers are brewed probably. I mean, I assume that for a beer like Guinness, the recipe is the same everywhere because it needs to be a standard mm -hmm. product, but it's got to be slightly different depending on like your water quality. Exactly. Like, the facility and everything else. Matter. Yeah. Lots of variables. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But I do believe I've in the States we get most of our, most of ours from their Dublin plant. And the only reason I know that is because, <laughs> I've been watching very closely, waiting for their conversion process because they are working to make their beer that is bottled or brewed and bottled in their in the uh, Dublin plant to be vegan, oh. changing their their finishing product. Oh, so okay. they've been working on that, changing over um, their processes in the Dublin plant because that's the beer that we get in the states. So, okay, so um, oh, I got a question for you. What makes a beer vegan or not vegan? Um, it, Mostly has to deal with the uh, the filtering process, the the isinglass, the fish bladders that they yeah. use. So. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we don't use any of that. Our beers are excellent. Making. Love stone. All right, so put you on the spot so, here. Um, <laughs> yes. IPA question. Do you know your uh -huh. your your history of IPAs? How they came about? Wasn't it okay, out of necessity so or something? With shipping across um, the across the ocean. So. That's interesting. So my mentor, Mitch Steele, actually uh, wrote a book uh, three years ago. I think he published it. And uh, as part of his job working for Stone, they shipped him back to England, you know, countless times to go dig through archives and talk to, you know, uh, brewers and, and kind of figure out what the real history of the IPA yeah. is. Um, there was kind of a myth floating around that the IPA was brewed to a higher uh, uh, alcohol and it, uh, with, with more hops in it. So it would survive the trip in barrels uh, by yeah. ship to India. Well, the cause and effect there isn't exactly there. It's kind of more of a, uh, I don't know, symbiotic is the right word. It, was, it just kind of happened naturally that uh, that they they found these are the beers that, that work mm. better. So anyway, um, 
yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm doing a disservice by <laughs> not, uh, you know, being able to give you all the all the details. But, uh, you yeah, know, the, the book is just called IPA by Mitch Steele, and it is unbelievable. Oh, that's fantastic. I'll check that out. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put a link to that, too, in the description because yeah. I'm going to go find it because that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, and I had another IPA question for you that now I can't remember. <laughs> so I'll ask you another question that I do remember um, because I also learned from you in a series of emails that you're supposed to drink it out of a glass, not out of a bottle. Yes. Which is also something I have never heard. Why? Okay, and so... Like, why does no one know this is my other question. Like... <laughs> I feel like when you go to any bar, I mean, granted, I frequent dive bars, but like, you know, they're always like, do you want a glass of that? And I was like, nah, I'm gonna just give it It's beer. education, um, Amy. No Again, education. Ever... You just got to drink more beer and you'll figure it out. But no one has ever said like, oh, you ordered an IPA. Like, I won't give you that in a bottle. You're taking it in a glass. So what, what's the benefit? Like, what changes? Okay, what? so you have your olfactory senses are your sense of smell and your sense of taste. And even when you're tasting... 75 or 80% of what you're tasting is actually coming through the, the, your nose. So the combination of those two is what gives you the ability to really get what that beer has to offer. So if you're drinking out of the bottle, yeah, you're getting the flavors, you know, crossing across your palate, but you're losing the 75% of the benefit of actually being able to smell the aromas as you're drinking it. So with a glass, any kind of glass, cup, whatever, you know, you actually have the whole, your, your nose is in it, your mouth is in it, and you actually get something that's, you know, that's meant to be enjoyed, both flavor and aroma. Isn't that true with all styles of beer, it, though? And that's why we have different types of glasses, glassware for different types of beer. So there's the whole thing with different types of glasses for different I beers. I always thought that was just like a pretension at its <laughs> most pretentious. No, no, no. Like, there's function there. I, I, like, I'm not... <laughs> Because, like, I'm not a massive wine drinker, but my parents are, so I grew up drinking a lot of wine. The, you know, the that's white wine glass, glasses that yeah. have, like, this weird shape, and then the red that's, like, a big thing to aerate it more. And I'm all just like, I don't, I cannot. If you give me a, the same wine in four shaped glasses, like, uh, it's just wine. So I've always yeah. thought that was just, like, pretension for pretension's sake. But please, so for, enlighten yeah, us. So <laughs> for wine, um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of wine as well. Uh, in fact, right here on my lot, I've got 18 Zinfandel vines that I that I uh, am maybe not the best vine parent for, but uh, they, they're wow. coming along. Um, but um, I have been in uh, presentations where uh, uh, they'll serve you the same wine in four different glasses and you you know do the smell and oh, taste. And, and there there is some differences where actually you can't. I mean, my mind tells me, look, I'm I'm drinking the same wine. I saw it come out of the same bottle in these four different yeah. wine glasses. But I'm getting a completely different experience. Like I would, I would have bet money that this is a different wine if I hadn't seen it come out of the same bottle. So there, there is something there. Um, and in fact, talking about speaking of wine glasses, my, in my opinion, the best beer glass is a, a Cabernet Sauvignon glass. Hmm. You know, the 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 big bowl, the bulb on it, and uh, you know, so you actually get your nose and your mouth in in the glass at the same time. That's that's to me. You know, beer doesn't get any better other than coming from a Cabernet Sauvignon glass. Interesting. Most of the glasses yeah. I drink are kind of that, that style, you know, with the tool, uh, you know, because I, I mainly drink sours and gozas and wilds. Mm -hmm. So they're typically served in glasses that are more that style. Right. And, and the beer ones sometimes have the, the, the fluted yeah. top uh, or the yeah, tulip, yeah, the tulip uh, rather. Mm -hmm. And yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think once you get into a cup or a glass, you're, 95 percent of the way there and if you really want to get that extra five percent yeah you'll pick a you know you'll, you'll pick a, a wine glass or a tulip uh, stemware and that does make a difference mm -hmm. a bit of a difference does it have to be stemware i feel like as soon as you're drinking out of a glass the stem again it's just pretension for pretension's sake not to mention those are the glasses that i'm going to knock over accidentally all the time <laughs> well the, the, the same thing with wine why is wine stemware so you can you know so your hand is not warming the, the warm yeah yeah. You know, Amy, they do sell huh. those. I guess that makes sense. If you go to Total Wine or someplace, sometimes they've got fancy glasses like that that are plastic, so. <laughs> then you won't break it. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like... I feel like there is no one who would ever advocate anything that's designed to taste a certain way drinking it out of plastic because then I feel like whatever, you know, leached into the plastic your last round of drinking will then leach out and just destroy whatever you're drinking now. Yeah. Well, I've uh, I found at Walmart a uh, 32 ounce red solo cup that was uh, insulated, <laughs> and uh, I've had a few I've had a few beers out of that. Nice. Tastes just Solid. fine. Yeah, yeah, and and a solo cup. That's a 32 ounce solo. That's pretty cup. awesome. That's my own audio on you guys. <laughs> um, yeah. 
All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sitting here looking through emails because I know I had other questions I wanted to ask you based on emails. Um, I'm trying to remember what my other good beer question was because I really was curious. Oh, it's gone now. That's so frustrating. Do you have it, more on beer, it will, Jason, it, it before will come we move to on you. to other things? So, um, I know. I guess wanted to bring up HopCon. Are you participating in that? Well, the company is, but I haven't been okay. down there. Yeah, um, I've, the, never, I've never no. gone. It's, they've been doing it for, what, five years now? Or four years? I think. I think it was I, four I, years. I think you're right. I think this is the fifth. Yeah. I think this upcoming one is the yeah. fifth year. Okay. And that's and done in conjunction you, with uh, Will, Will Wheaton, right? That started with uh, the collaboration. Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton. Yes. 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 Uh, <laughs> thank you, Stewie. Um, can you enlighten those of us who don't know what HopCon is, what it is? Cause... Okay, so in collaborate, well, I guess uh, on the same timing as Comic-Con down in San Diego, um, we brew a beer with, uh, uh, the original collaboration was with um, uh, Will Wheaton. Um, I can't remember his name, the the, the guy who started Fark.com. And there have been a couple other uh, um couple other people have been uh, guests uh, yeah. that have the, the collaborated on the, on the recipe and we basically brew this uh, this ridiculously um, high alcohol stout uh, we barrel aged a portion of it I mean it's got it's got you know, everything with the kitchen sink and I mean you know uh, pecans and I mean you know you name wow. it um, once I moved from actually brewing the beer to supervising the brewing of the beer I enjoyed it a lot more <laughs> because it was you know so much so much yeah. work for, to, to make this so yeah so uh Along with the release of this beer, we have our own um, thing event down at uh, Liberty Station uh, to yeah coincide with it with the Comic Con, and it's uh, I've heard it's a really good time. Yeah. Yep, I've always wanted to make it and I haven't. I've had excuses for the past four years, so I'll see about this year. I'm I'm really curious to check it out because I always see the pictures and and hear people posting about it. It sounds like a good time. Yeah, yeah. That definitely sounds like worth going to San Diego mm-hmm. for. Never even heard of this one. Um, how how hard is it to brew beer with things like pecans and all of these like not super common ingredients? Oh, it's awful. Does it, awful. Does it get me- <laughs> like, how, how do you even do that? Like, how does that? Again, I'm the one who's never brewed beer, but like, I mean, beer is is sort of like what you've got like yeast and things that have to react. Like, how how do you just like work a nut into beer? You throw shit in a pot and boil <laughs> so, it. So. Uh, <laughs> throw shit in a pot and boil it. Go Pretty ahead. much, we we throw shit in a really really big pot and we boil it and then you know hope it doesn't clog pumps <laughs> and fittings and you know all else on the on the way out. It's yeah, it's 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 really awful. I mean uh, the end product. Yep. I mean I I love the end yep. product, but you know some of these beers we do are just insane, especially the ones we do with the with the coffee. And you know it's it's it, it causes it causes or has the potential to cause so much trouble with our equipment. You know we. Nobody, nobody, you know, 10 years ago, nobody was building equipment for making beers like this. So we got ours for, from, uh, uh, you know, German engineers and, you know, German manufacturers. They make their lagers that are, you know, low in alcohol and, and uh, no crazy ingredients. And now we're trying to adapt these, this equipment to making these wow. beers with, you know, all kinds of ridiculous ingredients in it. And it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. It's fun, you know, especially when you're not lifting them up, you know, 50 pound bags of pecans up and down stairs all day. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, guys... it's go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna oh. ask in all of these like crazy things that you brew, these like weird with weird ingredients and stuff, does anything ever come out and you're just like, Well, that failed and just like disgusting, unpalatable beer? Like, you guys are professionals. I had an ex that used to brew beer and he would get really creative and I'm like, Oh, you're maybe not that good and it was like unpalatable mm-hmm. beer. And I can just imagine that with like a fifty pound bag of ingredients. Like, do you just end up with like an entire store worth of just like crap. <laughs> right. So we have a couple ways around that. Um, yes, we brewed some beers that I've not been fond of for sure, but <laughs> usually uh, they don't make it up to the, 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 the large scale brewing. So we have, right. uh, we have a small little uh, five barrel, which is what 150 gallon um, pilot brewery actually at our facility in Escondido. We have a 10 barrel uh, brewery, uh, which is 300, 310 gallon uh, uh, brewery at our uh, restaurant in uh, Liberty Station down in San Diego. And those are basically where we get our, you know, all the creativity goes. So these guys can knock out batch after batch and tweak it here, tweak it there, and until they come up with something that, um, you know, we really think that we should scale up. 
you know, a lot of stuff is just brewed to be served at the restaurant uh, in Escondido or the restaurant in, in San Diego. Um, Does any of that stuff make it to the airport? Sometime, uh, oh, I'm sure stuff makes it okay. to the airport. Yeah. Um, so pretty much by the time by the time these guys have it nailed down and we scale up, it's actually my specific job to scale it up to our, uh, our bigger brewery. Um, we've, we've got it figured out, you know, at, at, at the big brewery, we've got enough experience where all the experimentation has been done on a smaller scale, which if they have to throw 300 gallons away, it's really not that big a deal, but you get to my side where we have to throw 4,500 gallons away. Yeah. It's not so, not so good. I love that about craft brewing. It's all about experimentation. That's so much fun. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I never, it, I never thought that you would just like do something small scale to test it. I just assumed that you're all just magic wizards of beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we are. No, we're not. Yeah. <laughs> no, just, just, just run with the magic wizards of beer. I mean, only if you want uh-huh. to, but I think it'd be a good, uh, you know, business card. Magic wizard sure. of beer. Yeah. Yeah, there are breweries out there that have funny stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um. So, I don't know, Jason. Do you have other beer questions? I'm good on beer questions for now. Wanted, we can we can move away from wanted, beer temporarily if you want. You, yeah, because I I mean I'm just just uh, in all the things that we've been chatting about for the last couple of weeks that we kept saying, well, let's save the story for when there's beer involved. Um, you're currently on a venture that is making a very odd way to make money on the internet. Um, do you want to talk about weird ways to make money on the internet? <laughs> Because you have experience in the gaming world, sort of. Okay, so we're talking to my son. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. don't know if you uh, want to bring it up. We don't have to, but I was just curious. No, no, we could. So, yeah, so about a I year think, ago. I don't know anyone who does this, and I'm very curious to know what a parent thinks about a child making money gaming on the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's it's totally mind-blowing to me that this can actually happen. So, so uh I want to say about a year, year and a half ago, my, my kid who was uh, 18 at the time, um, he, he applies for a job video editing for a YouTube channel in Australia and they hire him. And I, I, I'm thinking this is, this is impossible. You can't, you can't possibly have a career editing videos from your bedroom from, for a company in Australia. Sure enough, you know, I looked over the contract and, and it was, uh, you know, it was a bona fide contract and, and, uh, you know, he, he got on with these guys editing videos. So, um, with the, uh, I guess with the reputation he gained from, uh, from the voiceovers and the editing, um, he actually started his own YouTube channel and all he does is he plays Zelda or he plays street fighter or he plays, you know, uh, some, sometimes some old retro games and yeah. And, and people like log on and they tip him. It's, it's the craziest thing. I, I, I yeah, this, it, it, I don't get it. I, th- I I'm think okay people with it. have been you know, scratching their heads disgusting. for years about that because that's been a thing. Yeah. And still, the top grossing YouTuber is a person who plays video games. It's just, I don't get it, but it's a thing. It is a watched, thing. Yeah, I was watching a thing the other night, actually, about gamers who make, like, a killing. Like, not just make make money or make a living. Like, like 16-year-old kids who go to conventions to play games on a stage like the what MMORPG is that what it is the, the like online like World of mm-hmm. Warcraft or whatever I don't yeah, know yeah, I've yeah. clearly yeah. never done this before but uh they just do that on stage and they're like an auditorium is watching them play games and they're being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to play video games for three days in well, public and I just can't get esports is it. is oh, now now big absolutely like, we geez. are yeah no we want to watch other people doing things because we're too lazy to do them. I mean, esports has exploded in the past couple of years. This year, you know, it's being televised more. So you can watch on TV mm-hmm. these tournaments of people playing esports. With commentators. E-sports. With yeah, professional, yeah, commentators. Yeah, with full, commentators. Full blown production, through. absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't get yeah, it. Yeah, that's but it's what a thing. also blows my mind is like the commentary that people are just like, oh no, I comment on live video games for a living. Like, what? Like, no, <laughs> how is this a way to make a living? I mean, there are weird ways to make a living out there, granted. Um, but that's one that I just, like, don't get. And it is. it is. It's, like, the biggest, like, on YouTube, There's it's, like, gaming, beauty, and then they're trying to, like, make education come up as, like, the third biggest. Right. It's, like, gaming, yep. beauty, education. Yep. Um, right. And I can't get it. I just can't get my head around the fact. And it's, like, yeah. It's got to be weird as a parent. Like, is like, I mean, if I can ask, like, 
is your son going to try to do this professionally? Like, is this kind of a career path that he's looking into actually pursuing? I'm trying to keep him in school, you know, so he, he doesn't, you know, drop out of school and, yeah. you know, really try to, like, uh, put all his eggs in yep. this basket. But, you know, if, if you would ask me a couple of years ago, I said, this is nonsense. There's no way. And, hey, you know, he's, he's scratching out a few bucks. He's not making a killing, but he's scratching out yeah. a few bucks. And, and uh, you know, it's all right. He's making better than minimum wage, which is, you know, not too bad. Um, I, you know, I... As long as he stays in school, gets his degree, if this is how he wants to get there, then, you know, at that point he can make his decision. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally support him. Of course, I've sponsored most of his equipment and, you know, <laughs> so I've been yeah. invested in it. Way but, to go, Dad. Yeah, yeah. Keeps him... yeah, yeah, thanks. But, you know, he, he seems to love it. And actually, his aspirations moving forward, or one of his side aspirations, as long as he's, you know, continuing on his uh, progress towards a degree, are uh, uh, he's he's actually becoming a, a pretty decent Street Fighter player. You know, all the other video games he plays, he's terrible <laughs> at, and he admits it and you know, jokes about it. But yeah, he the as far as this tournament stuff, you know, he's been playing enough, and he thinks that that's the he wants to go and, and you know take a stab that's at awesome. it. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So with these tournaments, because I've never don't know this world at all. Like, is is it that you enter a tournament and there's prize money the same way yeah. that, like, if you actually enter a fighting tournament of, like, actual physical <laughs> prowess, there is prize money? Like, <laughs> You bet. Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, like, how much... And I, like, I've known... Like, how... What do people make doing this? I don't, like, what is he, the prize for, like, a tournament like millions this? of dollars. Says, seriously. Yeah, yeah. He says he's got a, a, a buddy that he spars with on a regular basis that's pulling down, like, 300 grand a year playing oh, Street Fighter. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, I know people that actually fight for a living, and they don't pull yeah. down that much. Yeah, yeah, it's it's completely it's, it's insane. Nuts. I just I don't really understand how that industry. It has, won't like, sustain itself. It won't last forever. But for now, it's a it's a legitimate thing. So. But I feel mm-hmm. like it's been going for a number. It really of years. has. No, like, I mean it's been it's, going it's, way it longer than I would have so expected. So many mega companies in the online video world. It's crazy. I don't yeah. know. I've still only played like Super Mario World. That's about it. Kerbal. Kerbal. Oh mm-hmm. gosh. Yeah. I. Uh, this is the perfect segue into space. But like, I can't. I haven't even played Kerbal Space Program myself in almost a year. Okay. I don't have the patience to sit there and like figure out my mass to thrust ratios no. and all that junk. Cool. Um, the math is the best part. <laughs> yeah, but when you're not a math person, it's not easy and it's just more frustrating than anything. I just want to build a rocket and just like figure no, I just I can't do it. Uh which is why I partner with Scott Manley to do it. Yeah. Because yeah. he's because he's an epic engineering nerd and also an engineer and he's good at it and I can just tell him, make it look more like this. No, nope, more like that. Okay, now now make that fly. Here's the here's the here's the numbers. You make it work. It's great. Yeah. Um, he is great. So, <laughs> have you met Scott? I have not met him, but I'm a okay. fan. Okay. So I'm yeah. a subscriber of his channel. In gotcha. fact, that's how gotcha. I that's how I uh, first uh, saw you is when you guys okay. did the uh, Von Braun rocket build. Yeah. Oh gosh. Like, that was. Oh wow, space historian. This is kind of awesome. Yeah. Um. That yeah. That was the. I I've known Scott of like same thing like online for ages, and then we we were both speakers at a conference a few months ago and I've never met him in person and he's exactly like he seems on the internet he's just this like big loud drunk Scotsman and he's awesome (laughs) we just like immediately we're like all right well we're gonna be friends we need to make this happen so like yeah literally we just sit around and get drunk and he flies things and I just watch him um so good stuff so this was it's I mean it's fun speak of weird ways to make a living yeah yeah um but you know he's he does have a, a real job um but this does lead me to my question, which is what, like space, what is your interest in space? Where did like, where did that come from for you? Cause this is, we, you know, Jason and I always say that it's weird that we have all these like space and beer and punk in common, but like, we don't find too sure. many people who also have like the beer and the space thing in spades. And we'll, we'll see what your taste in music is in a second here, but um, right. space. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, when I was, uh, uh, I don't know, in my early teens, I think uh, maybe, Maybe earlier than that. I think fifth grade or so, uh, the right stuff came out. And oh my God, that was, I mean, that was something special. That was something that was, I mean, never knew something like this. Or, you know, of course, you know that things happened, but the way it was portrayed is like, this is, this is incredible to me. 
and then of course you know I grew up during the the whole you know STS uh, uh, missions and um, you know I remember being in a classroom I think it was in seventh grade and they wheeled in the TV and we saw the Challenger come apart and and uh, you know um, so basically between the right stuff and just kind of growing up in the space shuttle um, era. Um, that's kind of what what really you know got me to really love and respect you know what was going on in space. Um, years later, and it, it was actually not until about ten years ago actually um, that I really got a a, a, a feel and respect for uh, the Apollo program. Um, I remember being on a plane. I was flying from um, I was flying from LA to Chicago, and in one of the on flight magazines, there was like this 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 quiz, like a weird IQ thing. And one of the questions was, you know, what was the um, Apollo mission that, you know, was first to circle the moon? Well, I had no idea. Uh, so anyway, I actually kind of reverse engineered the the thing. And if it if one was the answer to the whole thing, then eight was the answer for Apollo. It's like, oh, OK, Apollo 8 was the first one to circle the moon. Cool. Then I get to Chicago and, and I was basically actually going to beer school in Chicago for a couple months. And while well, I was up touring the museums and what the heck, I go to the museum and there's there's Apollo 8 right there in front of me, like feet away. And so that kind of got me interested in like reading. And I mean, these guys, these guys had, I mean, guts like you couldn't possibly believe. Yeah, we're going to we're going to shoot you out to the moon, circle around a few times. And yeah, hopefully we, we calculate everything right. You guys make it back alive. So that just kind of just that was the the jaw dropping moment of like how how incredible these men were to you know to to put themselves at that kind of risk. It's unfathomable to me, you know. So that was that was the start of my enthusiasm with with space. So, okay. um, just to, to plug someone else's book, you know, there's a new book out about Apollo Eight right now. I saw it on Jeffrey your Instagram. Speaker. Yeah, yes. there you go. Um, <laughs> I I haven't read it in like great detail, but uh, if you haven't read Jeffrey Kluger, he's an amazing writer. I would strongly recommend it. I will put the link in the description for everyone else. Um, but yeah, I, I'm super excited. I'm actually meeting him next week for like a museum night talking about Apollo 8. I can't wait. It's going to be weird, but it's going to be awesome. Oh, um, that's great. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what museum, because I think Jim Lovell is has a restaurant in Chicago. Mm -hmm actually and it's like all his space memorabilia is just like in the wall in this restaurant and apparently it's not a good restaurant but it's full of space stuff and i know gemini <laughs> 12 is in what uh the uh the museum where the adler planetarium is whatever that museum oh that's the reuben h fleet uh, no is that san diego i think that might be san diego yeah. um yeah I, I i can't remember the name of the museums out there yeah. but uh but yeah, I know whatever museum I'll bet had Apollo 8 briefly it has a Gemini 12, which was another of his spacecraft on permanent collection, wow. which is kind yeah. of awesome. Um, so have you, have you like done pilgrimages, bleh, pilgrimages, there's the word, to like other museums or to see other things or? So the three, the, the three main museums that I've spent time are uh, in, in order of how much I love them. Um, of course, the uh, uh, you know the the San Diego um, uh, Space Museum is great. That's um, a good museum. Yeah, uh, Chicago is wonderful, but really, the Deutsches Museum in Munich is just unfathomably mm -hmm. amazing. You know, you can spend you can spend two weeks in there and never see the same exhibit twice. Wow. You know, it's some some like for instance, um, in in Chicago, you can see the 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 history of the steam engine, right? And they have all these cool little models sitting around of the of of uh, you know scale models of um, of uh, of big industrial steam engines that were of historical importance. Then you go to the Deutsches Museum in Munich, and holy moly, there is this enormous room with the actual like you know sixty foot long, forty foot tall steam engine turning in that room. It's it's crazy. Wow. Very cool. Um, yeah. Now I want to know, I mean, this is a diversion, but how many countries have you been to, I assume, under the auspices of learning how to make beer? Uh, ooh, let's see. So U.S., obviously. Um, uh, Germany, Czech Republic, uh, Austria, France. And I, yeah, that's it, under the auspices of beer. And the two I'm embarrassed to have not on my list are uh, Belgium and uh, the U.K. Huh. That does seem like a missing link. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's yeah. pretty good to travel that much for the sake of beer. Yeah, it's um, not bad. Yeah. So it's interesting to discover to discover Apollo as an adult too. And like yeah. still get a sense of like 
the insanity of going to the moon because like what? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um Well, you know, it, it, all the all the media and all the press coverage my entire life, you know, has been, you know, space shuttle, space shuttle, space shuttle. Yeah. Which is great, but it really doesn't give you the sense uh I mean, nobody nobody really there was no no venue, I guess, that you know, that that pushed how epically awesome the, the you know the the, the predecessors yeah. were. You know, specifically Apollo. So Right. Yeah. Where where did you grow up? Oh, right here in Southern California. Okay. So yeah. yeah. Huh. So born I, in born I, in Minnesota, don't you know? And no. then uh when I was two, I've been here since I was two. Okay. So that's why you don't have anything like the the similarly Canadian accent. Which right. people, every time people from Minnesota, they're like, oh, are you from Minnesota? I'm like, no, I'm from Canada. <laughs> but yeah, apparently the accent is the same, although I don't hear it. Um, huh, I didn't know, I mean, I didn't grow up here, so I yeah, wouldn't have thought that like the shuttle got as much press around the country. But like, yeah. Well, we had Edwards know. here. We did, we did get it. Yeah, I guess Edwards is yeah. here. Yeah. Jason, did you have a lot of like public like press coverage and like school coverage of shuttle growing up in Arizona? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Shuttle was a big deal. Yeah. We didn't have that. Mm. Nope. Well, that's the end of that story. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, You're not no, a shuttle I, fan I anyway, so you didn't miss online. anything, apparently. But uh, I liked it. But I was yeah, always leave, space Leave fan. your comments below. <laughs> yes, please, everyone in the comments, tell me how much you hate me for not loving the Come shuttle. Come on, Amy, the um, shuttle. Don't dislike the shuttle. It's just not as epic and awesome and stupid and insane as Apollo. Because, like, let's be honest, Apollo is kind of a nutty thing oh, to yeah. do. Like, the moon is yeah, really insane. Yeah. It's really funny. I always have this conversation with, like, Apollo flight directors and astronauts. And I'm like, we, like, going to the moon was kind of, like, the most insane, ridiculous thing. Like, what were you guys thinking? They're like, I don't know. Like, they even in retrospect, they're like, yeah, it was actually insane that we did that. <laughs> Which is kind of great. It's kind of great when you have all the all the old guys sitting around, like always a beer in hand, which is my favorite thing about hanging out with all those guys. They always have a beer, and they're just like reminiscing about how insane it was that they did oh, yeah. that. <laughs> just like, yeah. ah, it's just awesome. This is awesome. Mm. Uh-huh. So the other thing that we talk about on this podcast is music. Mm-hmm. So for me, um, it's probably easier to describe the types of music that I don't like than it is to describe the music I do like. You know, I think that happens for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I can, uh, you know, pretty much anything but uh, country and western and pop, which I guess country and western pretty much is pop now. But anything outside of that, I can, I can really dig. And I know this is a ska and punk show, so um, the uh, my my ska background was uh, um, madness, one step beyond. Um, somebody gave me a, a, a tape, and uh, the two songs on it that that really hit with me. Um, we're uh, Madison one step beyond, and, I, and it was the uh, specials version of uh, A Message to You, nice. Rudy. And yeah, so uh, my dad was a trombone player. So when I was a kid and did, you know, band in elementary school, I picked up the trombone. And then, you know, that wasn't really my thing. So I picked up the baritone sax. Mm. So now I hear these bands, and these bands have the big horn yeah. sections going, and, and they rock, and, you know, just, you know, awesome. So that was the, that was, uh, I was into it among, you know, Many, many, many other things, but yeah. you know that madness. Madness's yeah. first album was that's something that, that really. That's special awesome, me. and you know, being a, a huge ska guy, like I absolutely love it when I find those rare occasions when a band does bust out the baritone. It's pretty awesome. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then uh, more recently, um, kind of just a cool run-ins with with ska people. So at my small little brewery that uh, you know I was running here in Temecula. Um, we had a, a venue called the Vault just down the road, and unfortunately, it's closed down. And uh, because my brewery was the, the the local bar, at least relative to this this venue, we were we were kind of where people would stop off before the the show and get beers and stop off after the show. And uh, Bucko Nine and Real Big Fish both uh, you know came in the brewery. You know, uh, Real Big Fish actually before and after their show, uh, Bucko Nine after the show. And yeah, I just you know we're supposed to close my city you know by uh, decree of the city by 9 p.m. But, you know, when those guys are in there, no, beers are flowing. It's on me, and we're closing when people awesome. leave. Yeah. Why 9 p.m.? <laughs> oh, it's, it's yeah, it's an industrial area in the city. They don't want, they, you know, if people are drinking, they don't want the to have to, you know, have extra police presence there. So it's just kind of one of the things. Did you ever get in trouble for keeping the keeping the bar open late for bands? Uh, no, no, absolutely not. Uh, we I did keep, awesome. get in, well, 
we had cops like tapping at the window sometimes when I had the door locked and I'd, you know, tap on it back and give them the thumbs up and hold up the beer and, <laughs> you know, they'd be on their way. That's, um, that's the nicest I've ever heard of police being, I think. <laughs> right. Well, this is Temecula, wow. you know. Yeah. Um, I have it's no funny idea that where Temecula both of those is. bands you mentioned are still around, which, which is, you know. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, and the coolest guys, the coolest guys, you know, you'll ever oh. meet. Which is yeah, it's it's gotta it's gotta be cool to like have those guys come into your bar and just like hang out with them and uh-huh. like they're just humans that are yeah, yeah, yeah. drop all the airs and they're just like they're just cool people that just wanna it come really and drink a bunch yeah. of beer. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And of course my staff mocked me, you know, when Real Big Fish came in before their show, I played their song Beer for Them over our, our stereo system. They're like, You dork. It's like, Yeah, That's you're right. You. I love it. Yep. Yeah. But, yeah, and, and Temecula, mean, by the way, uh, uh, about an hour and fifteen minutes southeast of uh, LA, Pasadena. Okay, okay, I yeah, I feel like if I've never heard of Temecula living out here for three years, it's probably because it's a very small place. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little big country. Yeah, um, yeah, I've never, I've never heard of it before. Fun times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so what is the relationship between Stone and Ska Brewing, speaking of Ska and beer? Yeah, okay, so uh, Ska, Durango, Colorado, we're their yeah. Southern California distributor. So Stone, oh, we have okay. Uh, okay. the brewery, and we also have uh, the distribution side, which thankfully for the distribution side, it, that's that was our moneymaker for the first mm-hmm. 13 years in business. So yeah, and Ska Brewing is one of the brands that, that uh, we distribute all throughout right. uh, San Diego, LA, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino counties. Mm. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. That, yeah, it seems to be a beer that I can never find in stores. Mm-hmm. I never yeah. know how to get my hands on it. I, it's and like people, I just like meet people who are like, oh yes, I just know somebody that give like distributes it, and then I have all of this, and it's like awesome. Why do I not have access to this? And it's okay, yeah. that makes more sense. Yeah, you know, with the the what, 150 breweries in Southern California that have their own followings, it's tough to be an outsider and kind of penetrate into that business, yeah. especially if you're the size of Ska Brewing, yeah. you know? They have great beer and a great re- reputation, yeah. but they're competing with 150 local breweries. Yeah. There are 150 local craft breweries in Southern California? I At guess least. That's... At least. Probably closer to 200. I think we have 130 just in San Diego so County. So, Amy, what you need to do is, Seriously? in November, you need to go Great to... Great core, apparently. So we, it, the, the San Diego, what is it? The San Diego Beer Week or whatever. It's called a big beer thing in November, right? San Diego has a big beer festival. We do have one for a week in, I don't know what month. But okay, yes, I just, I just saw a billboard for it in Phoenix. So, <laughs> right. so, but yeah, San Diego has tons of beer fest. But if you go to one of those, Amy, you'll, you'll just kind of get an idea of how many. And that's San Diego. It's not LA. But yeah, the beer scene there is crazy yeah, awesome. And LA's, yeah, LA has been screaming itself. It has, you know? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like aware of a few local local small breweries near me, but not that many. And honestly, one of my favorites that like we have a tap, I have a tap house about a mile from my house, which is great, like a stone tap house. Um, mm-hmm. That's yeah, but I don't I don't know. I'm not I'm not educated enough. Apparently, I need to drink more. This is like my that's your education. Drink, drink more. Yeah. The last hour of hanging out is yes. I need to be drinking yes. more. Apparently. So at one of LA's yeah, one of one of LA's breweries is it's Golden Road, right? Golden Road is in LA think so yep yep and uh i just started seeing those in yeah, my, just, my grocery store here in phoenix some of golden road stuff so right so golden road is one of the ones that just sold out to uh i can't remember if it was imbev um but they just sold out to one of the okay. big breweries or big brewing conglomerates so that's what they so they have great distribution okay. now yeah it's something you mentioned earlier talking about the the the, the size of of your your places where you do your experimentation um Ten Barrel, name of the brewery, one of my favorite breweries uh, from the Northwest, Ten Barrel Brewing. Yep, yep. Um, they're out of Oregon, but uh, I found them in, in Boise, Idaho, and they are expanding like crazy because they're owned mm-hmm. by AB now, and um, they're opening a location in San Diego, which they've been like fighting for the past couple of years, but apparently that's happening. But yeah. they're, they're getting into San Diego too, but Ten Barrel Brewing, like those guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. I actually met them. Uh, they were visiting Stone okay. maybe a couple of years, two yeah. years ago, and I got to meet them. And yeah, cool, cool. They do people. a lot of fun experimentation. I fell in love with them right away, and they do a lot of interesting sours mm-hmm. and stuff. So of course that that sells me. So. Oh yeah. 
And Ska Brewing just, you know, I follow them and they're posting that they've got a sour now on tap at their brewery. And, oh, man. Such mm. a tease. Such a tease. <laughs> yeah. Have to make, yep. the, make a beer trip up to... Durango, yeah. Did you say Boulder? Durango. Durango. Yeah, yeah. Durango. And actually, Durango has a, it has a handful. There's, uh, I think, it's been a few years since I was there, but it was a good four, maybe five breweries there, every one of which was worth visiting. Yeah. Right. That so, is a beer town yeah, for sure. It's got its own yeah. Little... They've got a little pocket. One of my one of my cousins lived in Durango for a number of years and he always mentioned that there was a lot of beer going on out there. And I was like, I've never heard of Durango. How is it like a hub of like fun people and because beer? Because it's in Colorado. I've never heard like, of this. If it's in Colorado, it yeah. probably is a hub of beer. So. Yeah. Um yeah. I remember the beer question I was going to ask nice. you like an hour Good ago. Work. All right. <laughs> As Jason mentioned, sours, and then I remember that you're vegan. Um, the fish bladder thing. Yes. Okay. So this is a two-part question. Okay. A, like what? Um, what, like how, like where in the process does this come in and like what is it? And B, do you know, I mean, I, I'm going to just go on a limb and say that you know more about the history of beer than either of us. Um, who... Who the fuck looked at a fish bladder and said, <laughs> let's use this in making beer? This is one of those things I think about a lot. Like, drinking cow milk. Who said, look at that giant black and white mess of mammal. I'm going to go suck on that. Like, <laughs> who, who decided that this is the way to filter beer? So, like, I, can you shed any light on this? I feel like I only ever think about this question when we're recording this podcast. And I never go and, like, just Google it myself. Um, go on. All right. <laughs> so there, there's basically two parts in the brewing process where we, uh, people can use what's called finings. Finings have a, like a slightly positive charge on the, on the molecule and it basically attracts or coagulates the, the, um, other molecules that cause haze and, you know, uh, including yeast cells and basically clumps them together and gets them to drop out of the solution. So, um, instead of having to filter it through like, a, you know, a, whether it be a paper cartridge media or diatomaceous earth media, you actually actually get it to just fall to the bottom of the tank by um, putting this, this uh, fish bladder stuff in there. Now, the history of that, of who the fuck thought of that, I, I have no idea because that I mean, is it's, completely It's big in winemaking for sure, so, mm -hmm. but I don't know. So yeah, so... It is, so it said yeah. it's charred, it's, there's charged molecules on this, like, it's like, is it... Is it like physical, like physical pieces of fish bladder, or is it like an enzyme extracted from it? It's, what is it? Yeah, in a, in a, in a and most of the times it comes in like this this granulated powder. Okay. Um, other times you can get it in uh, in a liquid, but yeah, you just kind of throw it in your boil kettle or you throw it in your fermenter, and it uh, it basically um, goes and collects stuff into chunks, and gravity drops it to the bottom of the tank over the course okay. of a day or so. Okay, so if you're making a vegan beer, how do you, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this one, but how do you skip a, this process of, like, taking out the bad things you want to get rid of if you're not using a fish bladder? Right. Okay, so for us, we <laughs> use something called... Fish bladder. Yeah. Uh. No. Uh, we use something called Whirlflock, which is, uh, I think, made from seaweed or something like that. So we use this uh, on the hot side in the, in the boil side. And then on the on the cold side, you know, once we, you know, once it leaves the brew house, it gets cooled down, pitch the yeast, and uh, then chill it down before filtration. Our filtration is two stage. We use a centrifuge um, that we run our beer through, and then we filter it. So, um, yeah. So, so basically, the beer goes through this, you know, big, I don't know, like a washing machine sized machine that basically spins at like four thousand RPM. Mm -hmm. um, all of the all of the chunks float to the outside and get ejected. All of the beer goes to the center and gets passed on through to the, to the mm -hmm. filter. And then the filter, we just use, um, a, uh, a, um, I guess a synthetic, um, diatomaceous inert diatomaceous earth like thing. It's like diatomaceous earth, but not toxic <laughs> basically. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then that, that's how we, uh, that's how we clear up our beer. Okay. So there are, there are definitely vegan okay. alternatives to, uh, to the, anything that's out there that has to do with uh, gelatin, yep. you know, horse hooves yep. and, uh, and, uh, ice glass. <laughs> Wait, where do horse hooves come into this? Is this another yep. thing that you use to clar clarify beer? Yeah, gelatin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What? Ew. Why? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. is it? <laughs> same, same reason. Yep. It's just, it, it works. Somebody figured it out back then. Yeah. This, this is like, I. Oh, I I have got to go figure out who 
to the fish platter and was like, let's throw that in beer because uh, it makes sense. Again, okay. beer's all about yeah, experimentation, so I guess it always has been. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> apparently. But I feel right. like... So- no, we were definitely fishing before we started making beer, but like beer's been around for a long time mm-hmm. in places where I feel like you wouldn't necessarily have access to fish, like Egypt, like ancient yeah. well, Egypt. I'm, I'm going to guess that the, the whole finding thing has only been happening maybe for the last 200 years and not going back to like the six or seven or 8,000 year mm-hmm. history of beer. Right. Yeah. Again, just my yeah. guess. But, you know, right. I, I think prior to that, people really didn't care so much about having That's right. clear That's beer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I took a I took a class in I think third or fourth year undergrad of the history of science and beer, and I was super excited to learn about like how the the chemistry and like the understanding of chemistry and beer making evolved. And it wasn't that at all. It was like how beer is the like a social element that ended up like like funding a lot of science. Like apparently Max Planck's lab in oh my god I'm not gonna remember where he's from somewhere in Germany, but apparently all of like his research was funded by Carl's Berg beer mm. yes it was like nice. like yeah all of these weird things and like it used to be the, the case that like travelers and like people touring through countries trying to like spread science. um all of the philosophy was done in coffee houses the science was done in pubs so it was like you would just go to a pub and you'd sit around and like beer became the social element that people would disseminate science through towns when they were sort of giving lectures and i was like that was in itself very very interesting makes sense to me but i never like Always okay. frustrated and not in the history of how understanding of beer making came about. So, yeah. one of these days I'll have to go learn about the stupid fish bladder thing. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you? Did you pick up any like weird tidbits about the history of beer, or the history of brewing, in all of your like worldly beer studies? Um, you know, I think I think there's more or less just one common theory on how it all came about. You know, it's pretty well documented that it was used for currency, you know, back in Egypt days. And, and, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, um, the theory, the theory is just that, uh, somebody left grain out in the rain and it sprouted and then they, you know, cooked with it or did what they did with it and they got a little bit of euphoria. Like, Oh, this is, <laughs> let's do this again. And that, uh, that, that just kind of developed through the ages to, you know, <laughs> Um, I am now going to call it being drunk. Yeah, well, I guess what it is euphoria. today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. State of euphoria. Yeah. Yes. Beer check. Jason, I feel like you're out of beer. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Andrew, how are you doing beer's on gone. beer? You, I mean, you've got, and I, I still have this. <laughs> I like, like that. high ABV. Like I still yeah. have beer. Um, Were we going to talk about celebrities? Yeah. If, oh yeah. Celebrities is the other thing that we had. Andrew, you and I had talked oh, about, yeah. and I don't know, maybe maybe all this needs to be like off the record so we don't actually talk about it on the show. But um, yeah, you met the guys from, from, <laughs> yeah, there, uh, yeah. again. I'll, we will we'll <laughs> we'll put the disclaimer like out thing. there again. You are not representing That's Stone. Right. You are here as a private citizen, hanging out and drinking a beer. So yeah, yeah. celebrities, <laughs> um, yeah. Have you? I mean, do you come across aside from like the odd time a band like comes into your bar and you hang out with them? Um, like, how do you come across these kinds of people and like what kind of weird stories do you have? <laughs> All right. So, um, a couple of things. So way back in my previous life of doing contracting, um, I had a four day commute to Long Beach and a one day commute to uh, Las Vegas. So instead of driving that or flying commercial. Got my pilot's license and got the uh, got the company that I was doing most of my consulting for to put in the lion's share of uh, funds for an wow. airplane. So in my Great. little airplane, you have a pilot's license too. That's so cool. <laughs> got it. <later. laughs> oh, that's rad. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's here somewhere. Anyway, um, yeah. So my my commute was five days a week, flying my own, you know, well, company paid for uh, airplane to either uh, Long Beach or Las Vegas. So we share the same the, the little you know. Prop planes share the same terminals as the the private jets, so there's times that we'd run into them. But uh, the 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 funniest one. I, so I have this thing where I like to I like to call celebrities by their by a different name, confuse them with someone else, which I'm sure they're not used to, and see if I can get them to correct me. So uh, uh, the the most the, the the I guess the most famous uh, celebrity would be uh, Harrison Ford, where he uh, he flew into my local airport here in Temecula because he was lost. He had this gorgeous. I want to say, you know, he's got to be mid-60s uh, uh, de Havilland mm. Beaver, which is a Canadian, just, a, I mean, a masterpiece of a Canadian airplane. So he flies in this gorgeous airplane, 
comes into the little uh, the, the the pilot shop. It's, a, it's called a FOB, but uh, or FBO. Um, comes in and he basically asks for directions to get to his uh, uh, his friend's house in Lake Riverside. And we're like, oh, hey, what's up, George Lucas? GPS broken the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> and How, he just kind of like, turned and looked at me and gave me this this awful just this scowl of disgust awesome. and didn't say a word and then just kind of turned back to the people he was talking to. So that was that. Um, and then other times or okay, uh, so um, Miss December 1969 was uh, a, a woman named Cynthia Myers. And I'm just, I think she was one of the ones that was in the um, the uh, EVA booklets that you've talked about. I- definitely heard her name so for those of you listening who aren't familiar with this story the backup crew in apollo 12 stuck pinups in the wrist checklist for the apollo 12 prime crew so when they were on the moon they like opened their things and it was like survey her hills and valleys um and they were you know naked girls but uh yeah that name is familiar and i because I, I hunted down those playboy magazines to find the original images <laughs> ages ago um right. so yeah okay All right so she Met was her? a friend yeah so she was a friend of a friend and once you're uh, once you're a playmate, you have uh, basically you're you're invited to every Playboy Mansion party forever until you do something that gets you banned. So as a friend of a friend, I got to be your plus one a couple of times going into the Playboy Mansion for like Halloween parties and you know and stuff wow. like that. And that was my Playboy thing. Mansion like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, um, uh, I was just divorced at the time. This was like ten years ago. And I was just divorced at the time, so why not hang out with a former playmate that's twenty years older than me? It sounds like good fun. Um, that does sound yeah, fun. so going in there, and that was my thing is kind of kind of going around and it's like, you know, hey, call Corey Feldman, Corey Haim and see if he corrects me. Or uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, oh, the uh, Luke, Luke Wilson. Oh, Owen Wilson. I loved you. And da 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 da. It's like, uh, he's the one that corrected me. He's like, uh, it's Luke. That's like, hilarious. Oh, dude, Owen Wilson. I loved you in this. And it's like, it's Luke. So anyway, just stuff like that. Good fun. Yeah. That's. Uh... That's kind. Of, that's so. Weird. How do you know Miss Nine, Miss whatever, nineteen sixty nine? How like how was she a friend of a friend that you ended up at the Playboy Mansion? With? It was just. It was just a random thing. You know these 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 guys that I knew in business. Um, you know they 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 knew a couple of these uh these these girls that were former. They're, actually, their dad. Their dad used to hang out with them back in this in the sixties and seventies, and so they kept the contact up until the two wow. thousands. And you know, yeah, that's we got to hang out nuts. a few times. Yeah, it was wild. So nuts. Yeah. I love that Harrison Ford scowled at you and then oh, it was ignored you. That's pretty just, great. Just pure disgust. It was, it was so, perfect. Yeah, because people always, whenever I like, you know, men, tell people that I haven't seen in a while, like, oh yeah, I'm in LA. I'm like, oh my god, do you want to see celebrities? I'm like, I've I saw Keanu Reeves drunk <laughs> once, and like, wh- I what do I care? Like, there's not a, there's like two celebrities I would ever actually want to meet, namely, mainly just Tom Hanks. Like, and I want to be like, hey, can we talk about space? <laughs> like, I just want to right. nerd out about Apollo with Tom Hanks. Because um, I, I never know what I would do to a celebrity, but I love the idea of just calling them by the wrong name to see what happens. Because, like, what do you say to a celebrity? Yeah, like, I don't know. I don't, like, what are you going to say? Like, I, I liked you in a movie, as did the rest of the world. Yeah. Please think or, special. Like, <laughs> yeah, or you can just address them by their character in that, that movie. That happens and see if they a correct lot. You. I see that happen oh, so often at conventions and stuff. People are calling was, them and trying to get their, get their attention. Or they're like right there with them getting a photo and they're calling them by a character name. Yeah. I was. I actually had this conversation yesterday with a friend of mine that like at those insane like comic conventions, I, I've only been to one sci-fi convention and I was like the real science versus all the fake science. No one gave a shit about real science. And, and it was like, you know, typical Simpsons style, like in episode two, F07, when you did this, like it's this weird thing where like, people can't separate the actor from the character. And it's got to be mm-hmm. so weird to be a celebrity in that situation, to be like, wow, you don't know that I'm not the person on TV. Like you don't have a sense of reality. That's got to be so weird. The easiest time I as a fan yeah. had separating huh. celebrity from real life was when I randomly saw Marky Ramone at New York Comic Con and he was like oh. sitting at a booth and I was like, I'm going to go get, I don't do this, but I'm going to go get a photo, photo with Marky Ramone because it's Marky Ramone. He was sitting at this booth and it seemed really sad because he was selling pasta sauce with his face on it. I have oh no God. idea w- w- why, but there was Marky Ramone That's selling so Marky Ramone pasta sauce. So... 
I feel like I saw Norm from Cheers at a um, at Monster Palooza in Pasadena. It's like at the Pasadena Convention Center, which is down the street from me. And I went to go meet a friend of mine. And there's all these like I think there was someone else from like 90210 was there, but like Norm from Cheers was just sitting alone at a table with his picture behind him. No one's talking to him, and I was just like, "What are you doing? What is happening right now? That you're sitting alone at a table? Like you were you were epic in the 80s, I guess, but like." <laughs> that's got to be so weird when you're at that stage of your career. Well, he's yeah. set by himself on TV, yeah. so he's good at it. But I'm trying to think of yeah, the, the yeah. most yeah. awkward celebrity encounter I had. And I, it might have been at a UFO conference, but I was... That sounds awkward. <laughs> well, I'm used to it. But uh, it was at a, at a, a, a table, a vendor table. Um, and I think this was in... I want it was in California somewhere. I'm not remembering where it was Orange County. Um, and Thomas Jane was wandering around the vendor hall and stopped at our table. Thomas Jane was in the Punisher. Um, he was in the HBO series hung. He was in that movie deep blue sea about like genetically engineered sharks. Um, no idea, but he was wandering around and stopped and like, was a fan of a podcast that I was doing at the time. So he started talking about UFOs with me and I saw, okay, this is cool. And I didn't really know, I wasn't that familiar with him at the time. I knew like one of his movies, but I thought, okay, Thomas Jane. Then when he walked away, I noticed that he wasn't wearing shoes. He was just wandering around a conference barefoot. So, and apparently he does that. He's known for that. You. Yeah. That is super weird. And at any kind of comic convention, I feel like that's super gross and like, you're going to get a foot-borne disease. I don't know what disease, but like yes, some no, conferences disease. are disgusting. Either, so that really Yeah, either get one or spread yeah, one. Exactly. Yeah. So no, he's uh, awesome and and I liked the, him and it was fun hanging out with him, but uh yeah, the whole no shoes thing, like I couldn't get on board with that. The one like sci-fi comic convention I went to, I was told if you want to go in the pool, go in the first day because afterwards it just becomes geek soup. And I was like, "Oh. Oh." oh. Oh, it's like literally all these people who just don't shower more than like once well, every two pretty weeks. pretty much just like, like being at Comic-Con like, or anything because oh, you're okay. going through and like so many people in a tight space and not yeah, enough air conditioning. Not you are that they're because <laughs> their, their perspiration, like the humidity just like starts sticking to you. All of their stink starts sticking to you yeah. because there's so many people. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not good. It's not good. Well, okay. Yeah. How, how's that any different than any public pool in Vegas? I, there, I don't really go into a lot of public pools in Vegas. I, I sit by the side it's of the true. pool. Yeah, I, was I sit by the, the uh, side of the pool where I can have a drink. Yeah, I sit by the, uh, yeah, I sit by the side of the pool, drink, and like maybe go in waist deep when it gets really hot. But um, I went to – so, I, Andrew, I asked you about this, and you haven't been, which I, I don't know why. I just assumed that you would have gone at some point. But Punk Rock Bowling, which is yeah. like the big punk festival bowling tournament in Vegas every year. I think this year is the 19th year. Um, it's awesome. It's totally rad. I would recommend looking into it in the future. Um, and they always have like a, a pool party and I forget, I forget what the band was that played at the pool party last year, but it was like a ska band, like a bird ska band. It was amazing, except that it was at the, uh, the plaza, which I think was under construction. It's like the end of Fremont street and the pool is like literally just a concrete roof with a hole in it full of water. There's like, there's no <laughs> bar, there's no seats. And it was so, it's, it's, it's next weekend. So it was like, you know, end of May. It's so yeah. hot and everyone's standing there and they're just like sweating and drunk. And it was just like, everyone is just like, like, like sardines in this pool. And you're like, that pool is 90% beer and pee yeah, right now. Sure. It was just yeah. so gross. And I was like, I think, I think I'm done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anytime I like the idea of a Vegas pool party grosses yeah. me out so much. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Like, so I, yeah. To quote South Park, uh, yeah, they tested the pH. It was all P and no H. Oh, that's, yes, I love yeah, that. that episode of South Park when it just becomes P and it just explodes mm -hmm. everywhere. That is yeah. not, not on board with that. Um, yeah, although speaking of South Park and uh, making your living playing games on the internet, I do love the World of Warcraft episode. Oh my God, that's <laughs> It's epic. the end of the world. The World of Warcraft. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've got friends who started playing World of Warcraft because they were like, if South Park is making a big deal about this game, I should probably start playing it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which yeah. I thought was that was a, epic. just a brilliant episode, yeah, too. It was. it was so good. And whenever I think of internet trolls, it's just that guy in his basement with like the wrist guard just typing yep. like this. 
So in my head, every troll that I have on the internet is that guy. Um, my, I feel like I should, I feel like Andrew, you'll appreciate this. My most awkward celebrity meeting ever um, was Jim Lovell. Really? Right? Yes. <laughs> Jim Lovell, for those of you listening slash watching uh, Commander of Apollo 13, real Tom Hanks, as I describe him all the time. So I, I have met a lot of astronauts. You've seen my videos. The wall behind me is all astronaut autographs. And I've got an Albine beside me, and I've got signed books and stuff. And, like, jaw perk. I know astronauts. It's weird and awesome. Al Warden wished me happy birthday this year. Um, but I met Jim Lovell, and uh, it was at a... It was the 45th anniversary of Apollo 13 event at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. And I was there as media. I know the education director there, so I always get to go to these events. And it was the sort of pre-dinner media drinks. And I've always wanted to ask him, you know, 45 years on, if you can describe the emotional difference of seeing the far side of the moon on the last path in Apollo 8, wondering whether you'd ever be there again, versus seeing the far side on the free return trajectory on Apollo 13. Because, like, those must have been two completely different headspaces, obviously, but it's still the far side of the moon. Yeah, like, yeah. and Because, like, I've read both transcripts of those missions, and they're still just, like, amazed at what they're seeing. And I wanted to ask him, like, you know, in retrospect, what do you feel? So he looks at me, and, you know, I'm a girl in a dress with a press pass. And he says, well, you know, we had a bit of a problem on Apollo 13. And he sort of starts like <laughs> mansplaining to me what Apollo 13 was, and I just want to be oh, like, no. excuse me, <laughs> I want to be like, sorry, uh, Captain Lovell. Um, I do know the serial number and the entire operational history of that oxygen tank, so I let him finish. And um, yeah, it was it was sort of like that most awkward moment of just like I don't even like I've got five minutes of this man, and this is what's happening right now, and it just it was so uncomfortable that I had to be like, oh. uh-huh. Aha! Uh-huh. And then I immediately was like, okay, so let me switch tacks. Tell me about the seaworthiness test on, on in 1967, which was a test where three astronauts, one of which was level, went in stable two, which is like the apex down, upside down Apollo spacecraft, uh, inflate the airbags and then right and then stay in the ocean or in the Gulf of Mexico for two days to see if it would leak. Because they had to make sure that like if you land anywhere in the world, It'll take at most two days for a recovery crew to get to you guys. We need to make sure you can live for two days. So we're going to stick you in five-foot swells in the Gulf of Mexico for two oh. days, and you can't get out. The worst thing ever. And he looks at me, and I can see his face change <laughs> from being like, you're a girl that doesn't get it, to, oh, my God, you get it. And he's like, how do you know about that? I'm like, I read the report. This is what I do for a living. He's like, I was a sailor. It was no fucking boat. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> But it was the most awkward moment yeah, of meeting sure. a celebrity. Because, like, for me, astronauts, I don't care about celebrities. Um, again, Tom Hanks is the exception. Um, but mm-hmm. meeting a celebrity that was just like, oh, God, this is so awkward that I have to, like, prove myself to you right now. It was so weird. But, yeah. That was it. That's my good, like, awkward That's celebrity moment. Yeah. I touched I touched Tim Armstrong's back once. That was a good one, too. Nice. <laughs> yep. You were in the crowd, and I was like, Tim, Tim. And I touched his back, and he's my size. And then he walked away, and I was like, oh. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't have any other good celebrity stories. I guess I've yeah. met a handful of bands, and it's always kind of weird because I'm just, like, standing there. I'm like, I don't know what to right. say to you. Yeah. Do you ever yeah have, was... Did you ever have that when you're, like, when you have a band come into your bar, you're like, I don't, I don't know. No, I had a, I had a ringer. I had a, one of my employees, one of my brewers was uh, in a, in a touring band, um, I, uh, who knows what name it was, but yeah, they toured some of the U.S. and in Europe. So uh, I, I let just let this guy talk. I drank beer and listened, and you know, yeah. smiled and nodded, and it was all good. So they they can carry yeah. on the conversation. It's perfect. Yeah. So we've had Bucket from the Toasters yeah. on the show before, and one of my most awkward celebrity or musician encounters was with Bucket the first time I saw the Toasters <laughs> yeah. because this was back. Before I was doing concert production, before I had a concert venue. So this was really toward the beginning of my musical experiences. And I went to see the Toasters and I thought, okay, I'm going to go talk to the guy at the merch table. So I went to the merch table and was asking the guy (laughs) at the merch table, like, if the Toasters had a new album coming out and like, you know, talking about the Toasters, like, when are they going on? When do they have their new album coming out? 
the guy at the table, of course, was Bucket because he's always at their merch table. But I didn't know. So I'm talking to him and I clearly don't know who he is. Then when I saw them take the stage, I was kind of mortified and I left before they got off. So. Oh, yeah. And he probably doesn't know that story, that but we're good friends now. And I hope he doesn't listen to this because so. that's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> I love you, Bucket. Well, he might know it now. <laughs> um. Yeah, I feel like that's always weird because I'm really good at not knowing the names of people yeah. in bands. So I'll like, like I met the, I, I don't even know his name, but the, the and I love this band, I, the lead singer from Less Than Jake. Mm. I met him in passing as I got to a venue that uh, a friend of mine was putting the show on. And he's just like, hey, meet Amy. And I was like, hey. And I like just didn't, I was like, you look kind of familiar, but I'm visiting friends, so I'm not going to talk to you. And it's just like, oh, oh bye. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've had those moments a lot where I'm like, oh, is that who that was? Yeah, when you have like well connected friends and you're just like, I'm not paying attention to what's happening right now. Oh, wait, that was the guitarist from Bad Religion? <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, and for a lot of these yeah. bands that we're talking about, the bands that we like, you know, they've changed a lot of members over the years. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so right. it's, for, it's forgivable yeah. to not know everybody in the band. So. Yeah, when a band's been around for 25 yeah. years, but most of the members are 19, yeah. you're just like, wait, how does this work? How does <laughs> exactly. this math work? Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of that going around. Um, yeah. Which, you know, nostalgia tours. Yay. My, gen- mm-hmm. my generation loved yeah. it. I guess I'll separate myself generation. But um, yeah, nostalgia tours. That's a weird thing that I still... Yeah, so Jason and I were recently in, in Vegas. Um, we met up and he brought his lovely wife. And we there was a crowd of people one night as we were walking out to the hotel to go to a bar. And some guy was like, oh, it's the Backstreet Boys. I could not believe that the Backstreet Boys can draw. There, I don't know how many, like, I want to say hundreds of girls in, like, sparkly tight dresses that looked like they were on bachelorette parties. Just sitting there like... I would I would maybe see the Backstreet Boys if you gave me free tickets and free beer because it would be like a really funny nostalgia yeah, thing right. to do, even no, though I you. never got uh-huh. into the Backstreet Boys. These like, people were waiting for hours in a disgusting line. It was just mobs and mobs of people I, who were paying hundreds of dollars to see the show. And, it, it nostalgia. and they were beside themselves. They were so yeah. excited. And I loved, I loved that you could see the girl getting out, like, dressed in her, you know, heels and her little dress. And then her boyfriend in, like, flip-flops yep. and shorts looking miserable, yep. trailing behind her. It's like, <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> amazing. Let's not go see the Backstreet Boys. It was so weird. <laughs> but, weird. yeah, the, the whole nostalgia thing, which is, like, you're seeing all these bands come out um, and do all these tours that, like, you have, you know, their albums are 20 mm-hmm. years old. And the band mm-hmm. is completely different aside from the singer, but they're still making a living off it. Um, a friend of mine's actually the bassist for the Ataris. Remember the Ataris yep. from like way back in the day? Apparently, they're still actively touring Europe. Hmm. I had hmm. no idea. I haven't. When I drive past San Dimas, I think of them because San Dimas high school rules. football rules. Yep. But San Dimas, yeah, that's right. That's right. Right, right. <laughs> that you never think of the Ataris except for that one. <laughs> but like, apparently, the nostalgia in Europe is huge for these yeah. guys, and like, it's such a weird. It's such a weird thing to think, too, that, like, they're not big enough that they're sequestered, that they're probably oh. wandering around bars, and like, meeting fans. And it's always fascinating having their own awkward with, band. like, these mm-hmm. pockets in the world where, you know, some music from here is, like, incredibly popular there. So there are a lot of bands who tour more in Europe than they do in the States. And the Mad Caddies is one of those bands. They're huge in Europe, and they're almost always in Europe, and... You're just, you know, happy when they're finally back in the States because maybe you can catch them. But, yeah, they, they've they always been like that, had a huge following in Europe and tour constantly there. Yep. Just, I don't know. The music industry now is weird. I mean, we've talked about this on the show on other episodes. But, like, yeah, it's different and weird. And I think Bucket was the was the one who kind of went into, like, streaming music destroying bands. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. No one wants to see a band anymore. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, my, my, I know I can speak personally towards that. You know, do I, do I want to dig through the CDs to to see what I'm in the mood for? Or do I just want to put on Pandora or Spotify and just kind of, you know, put it in the background and and go with it? And yeah, you're right. My, my enthusiasm or my, my, you know, passion for following any single band is kind of dead because I've got a DJ, you know, I can just push a button and and let the DJ play and whatever background. When was the last time you saw live music? 
It was probably, oh, no, uh, this was pr- maybe two years ago. I saw uh, Cool and the Gang opening for Van Halen at Staples. Wow. And, uh, you know, I was never a Cool and the Gang fan. I was a Van Halen fan. And, you know, to see, you know, David Lee Roth back up, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, in front yeah. was, was kind of cool. You know, when they were, you know, he was doing his kicks, his kicks were maybe, you know, eight inches off the ground instead of, you know, up yeah. to his, his shoulders. It was right. pretty funny. That's still but impressive. I'll tell you what, cool. Yeah. Cool and the gang crushed yeah. it. You know that, I mean, you know, of yeah. course they have all the horns yeah. going on and, you know, they, they just destroyed it. And then, you know, Van Halen, I always want to see, you know, uh, uh, Eddie play uh, uh, Eruption Live, which was, you know, which is kind of cool. But um, yeah, so maybe, you know, two years ago. That's, that's that's it. But again, a big venue, big, you know, band, obviously nostalgia stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wish I, I wish I wish I still had the little vault, you know, down the street that we could, you know, pop in and see these that uh, these guys come yeah. around. Right. But it's just, you know, right. doesn't yeah, happen. That's definitely one of the best things about L.A. is that everyone seems to come through here and it's not that far to get to see them. But, yeah, it's definitely. But see, we talk about we talk yeah, about younger people being lazy, but I think that's a thing with getting older and why you move away from live music is because it's, you know, it takes more effort to go to it's a show and, there's other and see people, people and it's late. And thank you. That's exactly yeah, right. For sure. Yeah. Sitting um, there at a concert and having all the bachelorette party. Woo girls. Band. Woo. Woo. Um, I, I, I'm here for the band. All right. I want to hear your woos. Yeah. Thankfully, none of the bands I've seen in ever draw bachelorette crowd no but they draw the bro yeah, crowd I, and you get the same thing they like to the hoot and holler crowd. too because they're drunk with their dixie cups i don't know solo cups i think the last i i saw i saw pennywise a few months ago um and i always i forget that pennywise draws like a massive they do. Bro crowd. and it was so yeah. weird it was like i was not i was not expecting to see guys doing lines of jaeger bombs I'm like what is happening right now <laughs> come on why is the Jagger bomb a thing anyways? Also, ew. Um, but yeah, uh, all of my purses just have earplugs in the, the little like side pockets because I just take rotating casts of purses to shows and I always have earplugs because I'm old now. And I you seriously need to get musicians like... earplugs made, Amy, for as many <laughs> know, shows as you go to. You I really do. do They're amazing. <laughs> I do go to a lot, instead I just have baggies of earplugs in every purse yeah. I own so that I always have ear protection. That's fantastic. I love it. Bad. But I love when I'm not the oldest person in the mosh pit. Then I don't feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's pretty rare. But... Not saying that you're old, Amy, but... Uh... Well, it depends on the... I mean, if you're going to see a band like yeah. Bad Religion, yeah. like, they're, you know, their fans are going to be on the older side, because they're on the older side. Oh, my God. I do enjoy that. I do enjoy going to those shows and seeing 50 year olds in the pit. It's, it's kind of fun. I just smile. (laughs) But I love that. It's like, it's a mix of 50 year olds and then like, you know, late thirties, early forties people with their kids. Oh, I love that. Like my favorite. I love the generational thing. Like a punk dad with a little punk kid with like, you know, a four year old with a mohawk and like his little studded jacket. And I'm just like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. That was the, one of the best things for me when I had a venue was that it was an all ages venue and we catered to that younger crowd, giving them a safe place Mm -hmm. to come and, and just enjoy music. So we would have bands playing there and they would bring out generations of their family and so they would be there with their yeah. parents and their grandparents and their grandparents would be out there <laughs> dancing. Well, this is amazing. Yeah. Grandparents dancing at a punk rock show. It was great. <laughs> the weirdest thing I saw for that, um, Jason, I know you were a fan. I don't know if you're a fan of uh, Reverend Horton Heat oh, at yeah. all. Like, I've, I've heard and listened and enjoyed, yeah. but I wouldn't say I'm you know, a follower. Right. Yeah. I'm, I mean, every once in a while, I'll just like check out venues near me and be like, oh, I like that band. I'll go for 20 bucks. Um, and, and I've like, that's how I found Reverend Horton Heat. And I was like, this is worth going to. And it's worth going to because the crowd is so weird. It's like on the one White hand, diverse. you've got the really crowd. It's like, like girls in oh, like yeah. the, the elbow length gloves and like the full hair, makeup, ev- like dress, everything. Yep. But because he's like psycho Billy and works really closely with like, like punk bands mm-hmm. the uh what's his name from the dead kennedys uh jello what's i can't remember his last name but his new band yes his new band opened for Reverend and horton heat so you have these like aging punk guys in like their 60s yep. with their kids who are 16 and then these girls in full-on rockabilly dress and these greaser guys and cowboys I'm too like people there. in full cowboy hats and, and cowboy, stuff yeah. and love like, it the, 
like you look around here like what is yep. happening right now and i'm just staying there and like this 60 year old man i'm not kidding stood like climbed up my body and launched himself into a mosh pit oh, off of me <laughs> I was just like, I don't know what's happening right now, but I feel like I should leave, but I'm not. <laughs> it's so weird. But you know, that yeah, is a fantastic I crowd it, like, at his shows. Yeah, for sure. It was those those crowds are always so weird, and they're usually just really, really nice. But it's like that weird thing where you've got the 16 year old kids that just like want to mosh a Dead Kennedy songs, and then the 60 year old men who still want to mosh Dead Kennedy songs that then are like in that mindset, and then are just like beating each other up to rockabilly, and it gets so weird. But it's really, really yeah. fun. Love it. Yeah. Music is fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I need to go to more shows. That's that's my thing. And drink more again. Yeah. Yeah. Drink that. more. More beer education. Only way to develop that. That's right. Out. So go to more shows Cheers. and and yeah. drink at the shows. That's that's the perfect balance mm-hmm. right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm working on it. Working on it. Few places have stone on tap though. It's always Lagunitas IPA is the one they have. Mm-hmm. At least now- where I am. Now, uh, as of last week, Heineken Lagunitas really? IPA. What? Yeah, Lagunitas sold out the remaining shares. Uh, Heineken bought 50% of them a couple of years ago. They just bought the remaining 50%. Okay. So Lagunitas is now uh, not a company, but a brand uh, owned by okay. Heineken. Really? Mm-hmm. Weird. I mean, I, maybe that explains why I see them everywhere all the time. Oh, yeah. Lagunitas is like the beer that like we're anywhere in the country. I'm always like, well, I know that's a good beer, so I'll just take that. Mm-hmm. Weird. Yeah, not a terrible. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, not a terrible business move. You know, huge distribution in a in a in a boatload of cash. Mm. Yep. Yeah, makes sense. It's like a Uh standard decent IPA, but um, Heineken is one of those beers that I've felt I've actually tasted a difference in depending on where it where I am. Ah, yes, absolutely. And that is one. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, um, my friend Lyle, who's been on the show before, um, he's the one who only likes Heineken that's brewed in Mm. Europe. Yes, and won't I'm, I'm drink it. And he looks, and I've never, I cannot, I've never had the two side by side to taste the difference. But he'll literally, like, we'll, we'll be sitting in the bar and he'll look at the bottle and be like, oh, it's not an import. I'm not drinking that. Mm-hmm. Heineken's the first beer, actually, that I was aware that that's mm. a thing. Yeah. Okay. So um, the green bottles yes. um, are subject to light, and uh, an off flavor in beer, when it gets hit by UV light, is yep. skunk. Okay. So white er- brown bottles? Amber. Yeah. We call them in the industry. We call them amber, but yeah, brown yeah. bottles. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so um, you know, you have clear bottles, you have uh, green bottles, and you have the amber bottles. Um, uh, take a Corona, right, and put one in your fridge and put one on your uh, in direct sunlight for five minutes. Then bring it back inside, pour them both, and you'll notice that one tastes like beer. One is totally skunked, and the reason for that is the UV light uh, cuts uh, when the UV light hits it. Um, in one of the hop compounds, there's a, a single, like a CO bond that uh, it, it cleaves. And what's left is the actual identical or very similar molecule to the, the one that comes out of a skunk scent gland hmm. in pretty much any beer. Yeah. What? yeah. So, okay. So, so with Heineken, early when Heineken was being brought into the States in their, in their green bottles, this would happen all the time. And Americans became accustomed to that skunk flavor in Heineken beers. It doesn't happen in Europe because it's fresh. It happens here. But when they actually have the technology to get it under control and remove that skunk flavor from the beers, the Americans are like, "What have? What did you change? We've we 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 love yeah. this. The, you know, you've changed your beer." So they actually intentionally let it skunk for the oh, American that's market. So weird, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, oh, in Europe is brilliant. I mean, it's a beautiful a beautiful lager. And when you get it here, it's this is mm. terrible. Why why do people put up with this? Well, it's 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 the customer right. base. They grew accustomed to it. Didn't want yep. it changed. Oh, that's so weird. Now I really want to get two different bottles of Heineken and have them side by side. Yeah, you need to. Or yeah, actually, you can do it with Corona. Like I said, get get two Coronas, yeah. you know, one in the sun for a few yeah. minutes and one not, and you, you'll notice a huge mm. difference. No, as you're as you're saying that, I'm literally literally looking at my windowsill, thinking I do get direct sunlight for a very brief moment in the late afternoon. I'm gonna try this one day. <laughs> huh? That's gonna be so weird, huh? Yeah, and actually, the same thing will happen with the pint of IPA. If you're at a place that's outdoors, your pint of IPA, as you know, if it's in direct sunlight, it'll it'll skunk as you're drinking it. Oh, sun! So much more science yep, and beer absolutely. that I've ever realized is a thing. Oh, that's so weird, but so cool, and also really gross in a way. Oh, there's lots of gross things going on with beer for sure. It's all science. 
<laughs> I know. When you like when you think about beer and that it's like an active fermentation and all that, it's no, it's disgusting. It's like a little yeah. bit really gross, but <laughs> but it's then add in some horse hooves um, and some fish bladders. You got a good drink there. Right. So bad. Oh god. The fish, I've gotta go find out about this fish bladder thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Jason, you're into the uh, you're into the wild beers. How about a little bit Britannomyces in that, where you get uh, the flavors that are you know horse blanket or or uh, horse or barnyard stall, right. you know, as as a as a sought after flavor in the particular yeah, that's beer. So weird. Like I'm so fascinated yeah. by different flavors and flavor profiles and just the way they're described too. Mm-hmm. I have I have a question for Jason. I ne- I never thought of this, but you're vegan. What about open air fermented beers? Because I know like lambics are typically done in this way, and I don't really know what it is, but like there's insects involved. Right. So would you drink that? No, you have to have to be aware of of how the lambics are made, and a lot of lambics, yeah, because okay. of the the bug issue. Yep. No. But they're not being killed. But they're not being killed. They're just like being stupid. Yes. <laughs> you know yes. I mean? No. That's that's fine. But uh, there are. I, yeah. I, I forget. There's some lambics. And a raspberry lambic in particular I'm thinking of had something to do with bugs in the process, but I don't know. I'd have to look into that. that but again, I, the website, barnivore.com, it has all the beers. You can check check your beer or wine and find out if it's vegan or not. So, Oh, right on. Good. Yeah. And I guess it should say vegetarian, too, because vegetarians don't eat animals either. So, you know, they wouldn't eat fish bladder. Or so. True. But, yeah, bar- barnivore.com, they've, they've got... They do a good job of keeping up with uh, with all the breweries and stuff, and so you just type in the the beer you're looking for, and it'll let you know which um, of those beers that that brewery produces are are vegan friendly or not. Oh, that's great! Right. Interesting, interesting. Huh. I've I know I've never thought about I, I'm vegetarian, but I've never once thought about beer being being vegetarian like, who at would all. Think that it's a drink, mm-hmm. yeah. I would never, it's right. a drink. I would never think about it. Cause like literally if I'm not physically chewing the meat, I'm right. fine with it. So like I'm not physically chewing a piece of steak in my beer, which would be really weird. I'm um, sure that exists so somewhere. I mean, they, they made like bacon like beer and stuff. Oh, so. it, exactly. I want to say exactly. Germany. Um, there's a, bar, there's a, a cocktail bar near my house that has a series of bacon cocktails that serves all the cocktails. So really nice cocktails, but they put like a giant hunk of bacon in it. Which, if you love bacon, is great, but it's sort of like, can I do this without right. the slab of pork? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. A Bloody Mary with a slab of pork. Oh, oh it's nothing better. Bloody Marys with, like, what, like five shrimp and, like, half a cow stabbed in the bottom of it. Like, it's, yeah. <laughs> it gets weird. Um, yeah, bacon. People love bacon. I don't mm-hmm. know. You're, you're nodding like you love bacon. I love bacon. <laughs> I love bacon so much. I like vegan bacon. I haven't had bacon. Yeah, I eat vegan bacon, but that's not the real thing. I put a, a picture of Pete, my cat, uh, on Instagram, and he was in my fridge because whenever I open the fridge, his first instinct is to get inside it, and I don't know what? why. Uh, he is – I live with a fluffy weirdo. I'm very aware of it, but he loves to be in my fridge, and I tweeted – or I, I put a picture of him on Instagram just like meowing at me in the fridge, and there was Smart Life Bacon in it, and people were judging me for my non-bacon preferences that day. It's very weird. <laughs> Like, well, speaking, speaking of, of <laughs> yeah, all right. Oh, yeah, you have animals. Animals. You here, have. A, I'm gonna say corgi. Did you say? Oh, come here. Come here. Pete's sleeping on the couch behind me. Oh. oh, what kind of dog? Oh. Cocker spaniel. This is this is. You gotta need to get up a little there bit. You go. There you go. This is Amber Ale. Hi, Amber Ale. Oh yeah, my. Yeah, she was so cute. She was my Valentine's Day rescue nine years wow. ago. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Hi, sweetie. And she, yeah. Hey. Oh, <laughs> love that face. Did you, did you wake her up to bring her? Oh, I did. She did you wake her up? On the couch. She looks a little yeah. sleepy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry. You can go back to sleep. Okay. You're internet famous now. <laughs> now you're internet famous. <laughs> oh, what a cute little thing. Yeah. My, it's my sidekick. Valentine's you know. Day Rescue. Yeah, yeah. So every every Valentine's Day, that's her birthday. We celebrate her birthday. That's so. perfect. I love it. Yeah. That's that's the best. That's the best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sidekick. It's yeah. Animal sidekicks are good sidekicks. Oh, the best. This is what yeah. I learned. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
he doesn't come when he calls, but he's over there. He's a cat. He's Maybe not going like to come shrimp. when you call. Come on. And that like that round thing with like his feet poking out to look like a tail. He's doing that weird shrimp sleeping thing that cats nice. do. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. We've gone, on, gone long <laughs> on this one, Amy. We should wrap it up. I know. There's I been know. lots of beer signs. And look, like he's, he's empty on that one. So he could refill. Right. but uh... I'm, I'm basically done. I'm, ba- I'm done enough. Um, yeah, sorry. This is what happens when it's just like fun people to hang out with. That's sorry, the point. People oh, listening. You. But I'm not apologizing to you guys. Um, yeah. Okay, so I guess, okay, the wrap up. So, Andrew, where do you want to direct people? To find out more about you, about stone, about beer. Oh, just, yeah, when you're out, maybe order stone, chip into my paycheck a little bit, yeah. and, and that's that. There's no, I'm not a social media guy, so there's no follow me or anything, but uh, thanks for asking. But drink stone. Yeah, oh, no, follow, we'll, uh... follow, yeah, follow me on LinkedIn. There you go. <laughs> yeah. God, do you use LinkedIn anymore? Um, we'll know. put some links to, to stone stuff and, and, give you guys listening and watching some information on how to find stone in your local areas again um because it's amazing here and i do love it uh jason you where can we find more twitter at acentric that's a-c-e-c-e-n-t-r-i-c so that's twitter and instagram as well best places post fun stuff lots of vegan stuff lots of space stuff lots of ufo stuff awesome stuff yeah sorry this got way longer than i expected it to um you guys can find me, Amy, at um, on Twitter and on Instagram, AST Vintage Space. And you can find me on YouTube here, um, which is also Vintage Space, the channel. If you Google Vintage Space, you will find me. Um, that is about well, it. Well, let's, um, let's, let's quickly please. jump back and ask him our yeah. final question. Oh yes, my don't God. forget we our, our question, question, Amy. We didn't ask oh. it yet. Oh, Go ahead. sorry. I dumped the gun big time. Okay. So, if okay. Forgetting that... Tr- like travel time does not exist and that you have things like oxygen and food and like magic support. technology. If you could go to mm-hmm. all the magic in the, in the, in the universe. If you could go to any body in our solar system, where would you go and why? Oh my. All right. Um, huh, 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 huh. <laughs> anybody in the solar system and why? All right. So I'm going to rule out, the planets. Um, I'm going to probably go with a Saturn or Jupiter moon. And uh, Enceladus. And why? And yeah. why? Um, I, you got me. I'm just going to I'm just going to say, you know what? It sounds I like I like the name. I don't know. Let's that go. That works. That works. And, you know, Oops. I love Enceladus. So you don't need to say any more than that. That's cool. All right. What's on it? Does Enceladus have vul- volcanism? Are there volcanoes on Enceladus? Uh, it's completely ice. It, it's it's got a got a subsurface ocean, and oh, it's, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, it's got active. Uh, it, it vents water into space. Very cool. All right, solid choice on Enceladus. <laughs> hey, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so. After, okay, belatedly asking you our final question, you listeners and watchers know our social media and things where to find us. So, Andrew, I will thank you again for joining us today. This is really fun. Really appreciate you coming on and, like, hanging out with us for an hour and a half. Um, very cool. It's been awesome. And, um, guys, if you would like to get more of these videos, go up on Vintage Space biweekly. Um, and we release them on iTunes as well. And if you want standard videos about space history, also subscribe to the channel. And um, let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. Questions for us, beer questions, music, space, anything, people you want to talk to, beer you want us to drink, anything you have on your mind. Let us know all those things in the comments below. And um, we will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for watching slash listening. Later. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.